Um, okay, so thank you so much, everybody, uh, for joining. Um, this is my favorite way to end a short week. So um, welcome to this LMA Next Ask Me Anything session. My name is Lindsay Bombardier. I am the Director of Business Development and Marketing at Lensner Slat in Toronto. Um, I'm also the co-creator of LMA Next. So I just have to say it delights me to no end that five, six years after we launched this program, we're still gathering, we're still learning. Um, hopefully we can do it in person sometime soon, but, um, but again, it's, it's a great way to end a, to end a short week. Um, I think we'll move on to uh, the housekeeping slide. So I'll be moderating the session today, um, asking questions um, to the extent I can, keeping people to time. Um, but on the housekeeping uh, specifically, um, we did set this up as a meeting. So I think everyone has the ability to turn their camera on um, and unmute themselves, but we did get a lot of questions in advance. So we're gonna ask you to do the opposite of that. We're gonna ask you to turn your cameras off um, and mute your microphone, but please do use the chat um, in the event that you have follow-up questions to some of the questions that we're gonna be speaking about. Um, do put them in the chat. Uh, don't use the, the raise your hand if you do have that option, but the chat's gonna be monitored throughout the session. So to the extent you wanna throw things in there, um, we'll definitely be answering. Um, if we don't get to all the questions today, whether in the deck or in the chat, um, we will circulate some materials afterwards. Um, we know this is a hot topic and uh, we may just not be able to get through everything in the 60 minutes. Um, and I think when you popped on, you would have seen that this session is being recorded. So um, for the folks that haven't been able to join us, or if you wanna circulate this within your own um, firm afterwards, you will get a YouTube link. So um, you can look out for that. So we are so lucky, um, in my view, to be joined by um, what I would classify as two heavyweights in legal marketing events. Um, we have Ariana McLaughlin and Carla Vasquez joining us today. So Ariana is the senior manager of events at BLG. Uh, BLG, I'm sure as many of you know, um, I spent many, many years at that firm. It is a national full service firm with offices across the country. So we've got um, from Toronto to Vancouver. Um, Ariana leads the national events team at BLG. Um, with a portfolio of 400 plus events every single year. Uh, she develops internal and external event strategies and really collaborates with uh, the C-suite of that firm and other business functions, including the broader BD teams, um, to really demonstrate the value of events and how they really are a critical business tool in developing new work. Um, Ariana is, sorry, give me one sec. Uh, a member of LMA Canada. She is also a member of MPI. If people are interested in learning about MPI, you are encouraged to reach out to Ariana um, after this uh, session. Carla Vasquez is the um, national, sorry, just give me one sec. My notes have gone a little tricky. Uh, the national events manager at Dentons. Dentons, like BLG, is also a national full service firm. Um, offices in six uh, um, cities across the country. And Carla is, works with the client development team at Dentons and uh, executes on professional development events, social events. She's also the current uh, president of Tilopa, the Toronto Law Office Event Planning Association. So for people who don't know about Tilopa, it's an excellent association for event planners. And Carla has offered to speak to anybody who uh, wants any more information about that. So thank you so much, Ariana and um, Carla, for being here today. Um, so like I said, we did get a lot of questions in advance, and there was a lot of duplicate questions. So what was great is we were, we were able to sort of bucket them into uh, different categories. And the first one, of course, is um, what does hybrid events look like? What's in-person events look like? I think we are in month one million of the pandemic. And, um, but in Canada, we're doing really well on vaccines. Um, the passport came out this morning. So I think that to a certain extent, there is some appetite for people to roll back into in-person events. I think uh, at Lenser Slat, we're getting notes from clients um, with the appetite to see us in person. Um, so we thought we would start here. Um, if you wanna just go to the next slide, we are going to um, hand it over to Ariana. But the question here is, what's the best way to manage hybrid events? So of course we define a hybrid event as you've got folks remotely and then you also have folks in person. And how do you deliver sort of a best in class, best experience for all when an event is hybrid? Thanks Lindsay, hi everyone. Um, great to see so many familiar names. Um, so I'm gonna take a step back on this and I know we are all using hybrid as the buzzword right now um, and really pushing that um, 
as what we want to look at doing, but we need to take a step back first and evaluate if hybrid is the right option. Um, just because it's there doesn't mean it's the most effective tool for delivering events. So it's really, really important to do an analysis of your goals and objectives to see if those are best achieved by a hybrid event. And from there, event design becomes a critical factor. For us, we don't want to just deliver an event virtually and in person. You have to create an experience that translates to both audiences. So it goes back to your purposeful event design um, and how you're putting that together. It's not easy. <laughs> um, you basically are planning two separate events with goals and objectives, and you need to make sure that you have the right resourcing in place for both yourself, your vendors, your AV team, as well as your lawyers. So if we have lawyers participating in person, we also need lawyers participating virtually as well to be engaging with our clients. I'll pass it over to Carla because I know she has some thoughts on this too. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and, and hi everybody, nice to see everyone. Um, yeah, so it, exactly the same. I mean, it is one event, but two experiences, right? So the experience for the in-person attendees and of course the experience for the virtual attendees. But, you know, if we are talking about hybrid events and this is something that you are thinking of putting on, um, you just have to, I think, first and foremost, you also have to think about your content, right? So is the content relevant to your, it has to be um, relevant to both your in-person and your virtual attendees. So, you know, um, so that you don't have joint activities planned that isolate one group from participation, right? So, so I think also, you know, that comes to format as, um, as Ariana mentioned. So if you plan to have a networking session post event in person, then plan to have a few lawyers on the line to facilitate maybe breakout sessions with those that are on the line to give them that feel that they're networking, but, you know, virtually. And to go back to content, you know, it's probably the most um, important component during a hybrid event. Um, because you have to keep your online audience engaged. So you have to just make sure that it translates well over video. So, and I know that we've all done this with all of our Zooms and all of our calls, but, you know, incorporating live polls, Q&A to keep everybody on the line and involved. You know, make sure that the event makes sense lengthwise for everybody. Um, you know, you have to think about time zones when creating your hybrid event. Um, and also, you know, making sure that your content is accessible on demand post event, you know, for those that aren't able to attend or that, you know, the, the timing doesn't work for them. So I, I think if you are looking to do a hybrid event, these are important components to, to consider. So I think, Carla, what struck me when we were um, prepping for this is you've been doing hybrid events given your structure at Denton's, right? So I think for some firms, this isn't actually going to be that new, um, but maybe the pandemic has just provided more, um, I guess it's just more opportunity for, for people to engage and for people to be involved in these types of, um, these types of law firm events. Exactly. And also just like you're able to reach a wider audience, right? And even though we were doing them pre-pandemic, we were also just you know, we, we would only maybe reach out to people in Ontario, um, but now we're reaching out to people all over the, um, all over the country. So, so that's also great, I think, with, with hybrid events. But even, um, it's funny because we never called them hybrid events. We called it webcasting. <laughs> right. And, yeah, we're a little sexier I, term now. <laughs> and I think that there is a big difference between those two. And I think yeah. what's really changed now is that we're looking at, and this ties into our next topic, we're looking at the networking and the social element virtually as well in hybrid, where before it was very much focused just on delivering content and static without interaction necessarily online or um, limited interaction with polling, where here we're looking to have a comparable experience for the online attendees with a chance to engage and network. Um, some stuff that we're seeing trending a lot is having a separate host for each component. So if you have um, a partner opening the session in person, you also have a partner opening the session for the online audience so that they have their own moments there. You can look at extra perks to make those people feel like they are part of the program. So it's that element that's the biggest challenge for us as planners, uh, but I think also a really big opportunity. And I think we've all attended a lot of things over the past, I think it's 20 months now, um, which is just ridiculous when you think about it. 
and we've all seen it go bad before and we've all seen it and we've all seen it go well and i think we're all uniquely positioned to be leaders in this and um set that tone and standard yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, Audie, Audie at my firm has asked, what kind of softwares do you use for um, interactions? So I think probably what she means there, like at our firm, we use Poll Everywhere for the polling. Is there any um, sort of software recommendations, maybe like one each or something that you could um, suggest? I'll I just Poll Everywhere as well. <laughs> Poll Everywhere is great. If people poll don't know, Poll great. Everywhere. Poll Everywhere is great and it's very affordable. Yeah. Um, if you have the budget, then definitely some of the platforms like Hublio, um, things like that, especially where you have tables, um, yeah. are very effective. So the ability to have those networking tables where you can have the audio and video. Remo is a great lower cost option of that. But if you are looking for an actual hybrid experience, there is a there is a financial investment if you want to have those robust chats, you want to have the breakouts, you want to have the different zones and things like that. Um, and you are looking at usually a, on the low end, a $20,000 per event investment, and that can just scale up higher and higher depending on how much customization you need. And I mean, it, it really, we've done, I mean, we, unfortunately we don't have big budgets here at, at Denton's, but we've made it work with what we've had, what we have, right? So we've been using Zoom since the beginning and we still get compliments from our clients saying that, you know, that was a great session um, or, you know, the content was awesome. So I don't think it really has to be all about the bells, bells and whistles as long as the format and the content is great, right? And that is when yeah. BD comes in as well because they need to help with that, with that as well. But something that I wanted to just throw out there, which is, Something that we've sort of tried out is we've been pre-recording some of our webinars. So, and sometimes because we are um, looping in some um, lawyers from South America, so to facilitate time zones and for people in Europe. Um, so we do this, we bring the lawyers together, we pre-record um, we pre-record the, the webinar and we make it, we still send out an invitation and it is live to the attendees. So, you know, on the set day, people join the line and the video comes on. But what we do is we get our lawyers, the presenters to come back on the line and be available for questions. So I think that's a great touch point because sometimes when they are in the middle of the webinar, they can't, they can't concentrate and, and answer questions, but they are available. So then I, we've gotten, you know, clients coming back and saying, that was great. I'm so glad that I was able to, to touch base with so-and-so because they're getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction right then and there. So I that's great. And then that puts the pressure off the lawyer to have to do both. And they're readily available. It's like a one on one consultation. Yeah, I totally agree. I also think that um, that's been at our firm a really good opportunity for associates to get involved because we generally do have a lot of our partners. We're smaller firms. So we have a lot of our partners on these things. Um, but prepping associates in advance, it gets them a little bit of um, not FaceTime because they're in the chat, but a little bit of time with the clients too and showing their subject matter expertise, right? Because you actually don't know what clients are going to ask. Um, and so I think that's been a good opportunity for some of our juniors to get involved. So it's a great point. Okay, I feel like we can move on to the next question, um, which is oh, the question. This is a great question. Um, we all have um, Zoom fatigue. And um, I think even as we're now rolling back into in-person things, um, how do you motivate your lawyers to, to keep up with this and to get them excited about the hybrid? Because you're going to have to have people that are doing the online piece that might want to be in person. And so how do you motivate your lawyers to continue to engage in this process? I'll go Carla first. Me. <laughs> I think that we just can, I think, you know, BD plays a, a big part in this. Um, we can only as events people do so much. But I think, you know, we have to go back to how things were during the pandemic. I mean, we're still in the pandemic, but, you know, I'm sure that so many of our lawyers were being proactive, you know, and reaching out to their clients because one, you know, they're facing a president to times and also because they want to maintain visible to their clients. So it's a great touch point. And I think this is something that we need to continue to encourage 
you know, beyond all of this, we still need to, you know, our lawyers still need to pick up the phone and still need to get on the line to see how the clients are doing. And most importantly, to see what they, what, what is it that they're interested in, in, in knowing about? What are their concerns? And I think that should get the lawyers motivated enough to put that content together and, uh, and deliver. And I think more so, not even just virtually, but encouraging your lawyers to pick up the phone and take their clients out. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go and have a Zoom coffee. We can now go out and do a one-on-one -on -one thing. You know, it doesn't have to be a big client event, but it can just be a one-on-one, -on -one, let's catch up and maybe not even talk about work, but just how are you doing? And, um, and so I think that will help our lawyers to continue to engage with their clients and keep them just positive and excited about, you know, the potential of one day going back to maybe an in-person event. One day. Ariana, do you have anything to add? I do. So I think a, a lot of this comes down to also what we need to do in advance to make it manageable for our lawyers. So scheduling is key. We can't over schedule them just because there's, they don't have to physically go to separate locations. We still have to treat it like a normal event schedule and not book them for three things back to back um, because the fatigue will be there and they won't be on their A game and we won't be putting our, pe our best face forward. We also need to make it easy for them. So set that up for success. So it should be a, a lot of our lawyers, especially at the beginning, are very stressed by the unknown. And I think all of us here can probably relate to that and um, the big technology shift. And we need to continue to make it easy and accessible for them. And we also need to show them the ROI. So um, I think one, and it's so important that once the event's over, we actually have our follow-up. I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later but we need to show them the value of these online experiences and also use examples of success stories for other groups and other lawyers to show them that we are getting real results out of this and why it applies to them and why it's important. And we also, then all this ties back into making sure that we are doing quality over quantity. I think there was a big rush at the beginning with virtual, okay, let's just whip them all out. Um, we can do 20 webinars a week. Um, but we all know that that's not sustainable, not only for ourselves as event planners, for our lawyers, but it's also not for, for our clients. So we need to make sure that what we're creating is impactful um, and that will all tie into the ROI and the value. Yeah, I mean, I think we are um, sort of lucky that we're at this place where there is a little bit more in-person happening. And so um, it's the mix of, I think there is still a need to do virtual and the audience is a little bit bigger, but then offset that fatigue with doing an in-person coffee or doing an in-person um, uh, dinner. Um, okay, so how have your firm's clients been interested in attending in-person events? Are you hearing from clients? Do they want to meet with your lawyers? We certainly have been hearing from clients, particularly mm -hmm. over the last month. Um, you know, holiday events are potentially ramping up at our firm um, and, and definitely planning for 2022. So um, I'll maybe go to Ariana first on this one, but um, what have you been hearing? Yes, yeah, similarly, people have been popping up over the past month. Um, and it's very mixed. Some clients do not want to do anything but a one-on-one -on -one, um, until the new year. So I, that's we were especially finding that in Toronto. Um, I think just because people really haven't returned back to the office yet. A um, lot more appetite for in-person out west, um, especially in Alberta prior to the latest shutdown. I know we have a few people from Alberta on the line who can relate to that. Um, and right now, we're seeing a lot of requests in Montreal because they have loosened a lot of restrictions there. Um, so there's just a, a more general comfort there that we're not seeing as much in Toronto. Um, but we are, yeah, so small things and um, client specific. So we've yet to have any requests for cross client events. So the cocktail receptions and things that you used to do, we haven't had any of those. It's been one client and that group with the lawyers that they know. So people are still sticking within their comfort zones. Interesting. Yeah, for, for us, I personally haven't really heard of clients. I mean, it varies, right? I think all of our firms vary on, on I mean, before pre-COVID, we didn't do a ton of social events, but no, we haven't had a big appetite to do in-person events. Um, what I find interesting, and maybe this is on everyone else's mind, is 
you know, it's so easy for somebody to say, yes, I am excited. I want to go and go to an event, plan it. But then the day comes and will I, and will the client show up? Will I show up? Right? Like, I think, I think we're at that transition stage that everything's kind of unknown. So if you are to plan something, will people just look out the window and see that it's raining and say, you know what, I want to stay home. Um, so I think, you know, for in-person events, uh, the approach that I find is, you know, if, if a client, say, like Bank of Montreal, they, they want, they want to do something, they probably want to see each other. So that's a good way mm -hmm. of them out in a small group with a few of your lawyers and, and start off, you know, small um, within the same company, like Ariana had mentioned. And then, and then, you know, hopefully, you know, in the later part of 2022, things will sort of kind of fall into place. But right now there's just a lot of unknowns. Like I've had questions about, you know, when should we even start the event? Should it start at 5 p.m. or should it start at 5.30 p.m.? Are people, you know, willing to like, because I think, you know, when you're working from home from a lot of our clients and for ourselves, our day kind of seems much longer than it would have when you're in the office. Because when you're in the office, you look at the time and you say, time to shut down. I need to now commute home. But, you know, if you're planning an event at 530, is that person in the office looking at the at their watch saying, you know what, it's six o'clock. Like it, it's I kind of want to get home. I have to commute. It's it's very finicky. It's <laughs> yeah. So Jess Horowitz just put in the chat that. Um she's at Torque and Mains, that she has a lot of clients who are excited to be able to go to Leafs and Raptors. So that for sure. And Jays, we just had a box at the Jays game with a bunch of um, lawyers and their kids. Um, I think one thing in Toronto and, and apologies to the folks that are across the country, I'm not as close to what the um, COVID protocols are, but the fact that we didn't see a big spike when the kids went back to school, I think actually has made people feel a little bit more comfortable doing the in-person um, the in-person things, but it's true that some of those smaller events like sporting events and that kind of thing, there has been a bit of an uptick in that. So I guess the second question here, it's a bit duplicative, but um, have you done any, even just internal events? Um, have you done any and, and what were they? <laughs> I think we're all like, what's everyone doing right now? So we, I haven't yet. I know that we have one coming up next week um, that is offsite. So everything that we're encouraging that we are doing would be offsite, not at the, at the office. Um, but so what we're doing, that's obviously a sit down because, you know, you can't network, you can't walk around all of that stuff. But the question is how then do you network if you're sitting down, if you can't get up? So what we're implementing and, you know, I'm happy to, to share how, what, you know, what comes out of this and if it works or if it doesn't, but since it is a sit down, um, light dinner, we're getting people to shuffle between tables so that then after a certain amount of time, they switch and then they can network um, with each other. So that's an idea. Will it work? We'll find out. Um, but yeah, I think you just need to start getting really creative on how you can make all of those um, networking opportunities in person work. Yeah, and we have been doing a few, um, and again, all social. So no requests, or we have not done anything content related in person yet. Yeah. We're just, we've spoken to our clients and they don't want that right now. They're not looking for the one hour webinar um, when they're not actually in the office. So we're st our strategy for the rest of 2022 is virtual for content, for substantive content, but we are starting to dabble in small in-person events. Internally, we are doing probably at least one a day, if not more. Um, so the appetite for our lawyers to connect together um, is really, really, really high. So, and, uh, and we're doing that on patios, all outdoors, all offsite mm -hmm. um, right now. So that has been a big, big success and a big morale booster. And then we've been taking that approach to some very select client events. So similar to Lindsay, what you were saying, we've done some boxes at sport sporting events, one-on-one -on -one sporting events. We did a cocktail reception in BC. Um, so at the time, there were regulations, and um, I did, never thought I would spend so much time reading reopening plans and risk, but you do have to look at um, everything is different by province right now. Um, so while you aren't moving around the way that you traditionally would be, you are able to move from cocktail table to cocktail table. Um, mm. There's ways around that doing that. And we are doing a redesigned event in Montreal indoors in November. Um, 
with a wine tasting element to it. So previously this had been an event of about 200 lawyers and clients. Um, and instead we're doing four 20 person events mm. um, to keep that appetite lower. And we're still doing a wine tasting where people will be at the, they will be at a cocktail table with seats mm -hmm. um, and the sommelier will be there. Um, so we've taken that event and redesigned it to deliver um, something that's within comfort level. And it's also from a BD perspective, allowed us to really target who we're inviting and yeah. ensuring that the right lawyer and the right client are together. Um, so I think it's going to be really effective. Fingers crossed. Yeah, it's a good point. I do think there has been a moment in time here where we've been able to prioritize some of our like sort of key clients and, and really focus on relationship building. So it's been a good opportunity for that. Um, I will give one shout out to Bymark in Toronto, super flexible venue, have, pat have put a tent over their entire patio that is going to be like an all year thing now. Um, so Bymark is a good option for the folks that um, want to do big things in Toronto. Okay, so we got dozens of questions about the COVID-19 pandemic and some very tactical things. Um, we've tried our best, um, just do you want to go to the next slide, Sarah? Um, to sort of package them in a way. We don't want to get too sort of in the weeds on this because I do think it is really dependent on what province you're in and what firm you're in. And um, like Ariana sort of already previewed um, how close you are to your risk team and these types of things. But I think Ariana, I'll probably start with you. Um, so you're going to do an event. How are you approaching proof of vaccine? And what if someone is unvaccinated? Okay, so first I'm just going to say a disclaimer. This is not meant to be advice. Um, please talk to your risk team and please make sure that you are following all your provincial guidelines. Um, this is just me personally speaking and is not meant to um, be risk advice. <laughs> um, so now that the disclaimer is out of, out of the way, um, we do have a vaccination policy in place that applies to our offices and to any event whether it's on-site or off-site. So to attend an event, everyone must be double vaccinated plus 14 days. Um, so that's the approach we've taken. Because we're doing all of our events off-site right now, um, we are only booking at venues that are checking for proof of vaccination. Um, I'm gonna leave, I, I, I know I'm, I'm leaving Alberta out right now because um, we, are closed there, we are closed down right there and I know that they, we're not up to the vaccine passport there yet. So anyone from Alberta, happy to chat with you specifically. Um, but we are only booking venues that are checking that so that we are not collecting any of the client's personal data ourselves. Um, and we're also, we are not personally asking for it. We are including all of this in our invitations and in our reminders um, so that they know that the event does follow the provincial guidelines and proof of vaccine will be required by the venue, but very much relying on the provincial um, language and regulations there. Um, so that kind of answers um, the question about if someone is unvaccinated, our events right now are uh, open to people that are vaccinated as per provincial policies with the venues that we, have, um, that we are hosting them at. We haven't right. had to have a conversation with clients about that directly. Um, so it is obviously a touchy subject and not something that we, um, that as event planners, that we necessarily should, should we not, not we don't necessarily should be the, sorry, wow, my words are jumbled. Um, <laughs> we're not necessarily the right people to have that conversation with clients. Yeah. It, it's our responsibility to make sure that we've informed people of what the expectations are to attend the event. Yeah. Um, and that we've also informed the lawyers what the expectations are so that they're prepared should a client come back to them and have questions about that. Yeah, I think one thing that is, I don't know, helpful, like it, everything is mostly external. We're not really bringing people into our firms right now to do things. But the good news is, is that all of our firms, like maybe I shouldn't generalize, I think a lot of firms have their own um, mandatory vaccination policy. So like I know at Lensner Slat, we've already worked through the process and we do have clients coming in for just business meetings. Um, so it's just going to be that at a larger scale when we do start bringing people back into the office. And then I guess the, the issue is it just puts the onus back on us. But we've also, like you said, Ariana, really engage the lawyers in this process like these are your relationships and so we are here to help facilitate uh, any awkwardness that may come up but really we're looking to them to um to help as well um carly you don't want to add anything or do you um not really <laughs> i i think <laughs> <laughs> um it, i just i i find that um 
you know, our, our lawyers are really coming to us, you know, for answers and for us to give them the green light of what it is that they can and cannot do. And I think personally for me, it's been a bit frustrating because I think in the end, you know, I hope that most of the firm's leadership, you know, they're the ones giving those instructions and giving the go-aheads and giving the guidelines to our lawyers of what it is they can and cannot do, because then, you know, we're the ones who, who then implement, yeah. right? So a lot of us, like, I think we put so much pressure on ourselves to have all of the answers for, for, for our lawyers, but, but I think we really need to, to rely on our, on our leadership to, to also provide that guidance and that direction. Yeah, I agree. I think it's um, it's the firm leadership that has to set the tone and then it's over to us to make sure it's communicated properly and in an appropriate way to clients, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Just to kind of to add to that, it's been a really unique opportunity where for me, I've been able to have a seat at that table with mm -hmm. leadership to discuss the health and safety precautions and what we're doing from an events perspective. So that's been really helpful because a lot of times you'll see decisions getting made with no thought to how things are going to be executed and implemented. So yeah. because I've been able to be a part of those discussions, I'm able to think of how in reality we're actually going to do this. And I do think it's really important for us to know what is allowed by province and right. remind the lawyers of how things have changed and that depending on where you live, a reception is not going to be set up the same way. So we want to make sure there's no surprises. But we're all on the same page with things like that, that we're using food set up that is safe and that feels safe for our clients. Um, so I think there is a lot of there is a lot for us to do there that hasn't existed before. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, but I think we do play a big role in that. Yeah. And it's funny when you say um, having to keep up to speed on what the provincial guidelines are and stuff. I, I think that's so true. Like it is, it has added a layer to um, the job that just wasn't there before. And um, it's critically important now. Okay. So enough vaccine and proof of vaccine and all of these things. Next question. I love this question. Um, we've been talking a lot at Lensner Slat about like, it's been a terrible few months for sure. There's been a lot of, um, uh, really hard, hard moments, but there also have been so many silver linings. And so um, I think one example we always use is our lawyers have like moved into the 21st century and have been in virtual court for 18 months and have really improved their tech skills. And it's actually made our lives a lot easier and the way we've been able to communicate a lot easier. So in the events context, what's been your sort of biggest learning since the start of the pandemic? And I'll start with Carla. Sure. So as you mentioned, you know, I think as event planners, I want to say that the biggest learning opportunity for me was just the willingness to adapt, right? So to adapt to technology, to, to adapt really to a new role. I mean, to really think outside of the box and how we can continue to do our jobs as event planners in a law firm virtually, right? So, so we had to become the AT, the a IT AV experts, which, you know, was my biggest nightmare to begin with when, you know, doing in-person events. And now, you know, everybody was relying on me to be that person, right? I mean, some of us have been lucky enough that our IT teams have really stepped up and helped us in that process in, you know, learning about Zoom or about WebEx or whatever, you know, platform it is that you use. But some of us haven't been so lucky and we've had to really learn things on the fly. But also um, thinking of new ways, you know, of reaching out to our clients, and maintaining that relationship virtually. So for me, it was sitting down with our BD team and thinking of, of, of different ways of, you know, not just doing the webinar, but what else could we implement? So a big thing for me was implementing podcasts into with our firm, which is something that we had never done before. And, you know, to get our lawyers on board to even do that. Um, implementing video series, um, working closely with our social media team to, to come up with new and exciting ways so we can share all of this content, you know, via LinkedIn, via Twitter. So, um, and, and I thought that, like, that was, I think, probably one of the biggest learning um, opportunities uh, for me to, to continue to remain, you know, relevant in my job and, and to, to keep doing new and exciting things, you know, to, um, for our clients. That's a good point. There is so much learning that you are like sort of top of the game now, eh? Like it has really blown open people's jobs. Ariana, what's your biggest learning opportunity? Carla said it very well. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I was chatting with someone the other day and didn't really realize until we were talking that how much our jobs did change. And a lot of people just 
took their job and worked from home, but our job completely transformed. So I echo everything Carla says. And I also think that a big silver lining for me has been our ability to take a step back and be more strategic. Um, because we can't just um, do these massive events where you let um, in person, where you're sending it to a list that you haven't really looked at in three years, um, you have to sit down and, and collaborate with your BD um, colleagues and lawyers to figure out who we actually need to be talking to and what content we need to be delivering. Um, I, there was a point where I think people were getting probably about 10 or 15 webinar invites a week. Um, I know I was. So it was a battle to stay relevant in people's inboxes and we were able to take a step back and really hone in on what our objectives are, talk to our clients, find out what they want and leverage those to de deliver richer experiences. And I think also it's kind of changed events a little bit. I, I don't, mm. events are obviously a passion and are key accountability, but we've looked beyond that to experience, I'll use the word client experiences. Um, so sometimes a traditional event is not the way to go. And we're seeing those one-on-one -on -one dinners, um, but our, we're finding our lawyers are relying on the events team to help them with that and to make sure that we know even what restaurants are still open. <laughs> Yeah, um, has been an ongoing challenge. We're updating those lists monthly, if not weekly, for a while, and reminding them of what they can do and thinking outside the box. People have also taken a step back from our clients and are focusing on their work-life balance. Mm. So we need to create experiences that are impactful. And sometimes that is, you know what, let's take invite people's families to an outdoor apple picking because that's something that's going to enrich their their experience and um, really strengthen that client relationship and it's something that can be experienced by their whole family. Yeah, I love that. Carla, I feel like you were going to jump in, you like unmuted and then muted. No? <laughs> I, well, because I was thinking whether we get to this later on, so maybe I, I it's fine. Let's continue. <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm also like thinking about what it, what it is that you're going to say. So I'll bring that up later too. Okay. Last category. And a big question coming up next is uh, drum roll, Sarah, go to the next slide. Um, so the relationship between events and BD. So I think we've touched on it a little bit that, you know, BD does need to be like at the forefront to a certain extent, cheerleading. And of course, like um, pushing some of the strategy um, around the events, but at your firms, um, what does the relationship between events and BD um, in practice, how does that collaboration uh, play out? And I'll start with Carla. Yeah, I'll say that. I think it's definitely shifted here at my firm. Um, Pre-COVID, it was, you know, this is our event, this is what we want to do and go, right? But now I have that seat at the table where we start, I, I, I meet with the lawyers and with the BD from the start. So sure, I'm not the content expert, but I can absolutely help with the format, right? So what it is, so once you give me the content, I can talk about format and I can help, you know, with that. But really, I think I've never worked closer with our BDs um, because like Ariana mentioned and Lindsay, you've mentioned content and um, what our clients are interested in, that's the biggest forefront here. That is what's gonna get our, lawyer, our clients to jump on the line and, and attend our events. So we're working very closely together on from the start until the end, and then also on the you know, post event. Um, so what does that look like? Usually I think Ariana has a bigger, and, and that's the second question, the ROI, you have more of a, of a role in that, but at least, from my perspective, what we help with the BDs is, you know, post event, pull up the RSVP list, and I'm sure everybody does this, pull up the RSVP list, identify who's a client, identify who's a prospect, um, who's asked the questions during, during the session, are we able to get their names or companies or emails, and put that information, give that to the BD so that then they can do that targeted outreach, and then the lawyers then can start reaching out um, to, to their clients. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, we're, we're together from the beginning until, until the very end, which is something that was not, you know, we weren't, I wasn't used to that pre-COVID. That's good. That's a silver lining. It's Audie just put in the, lining. Audie Reza just put in the chat that, um, collaboration has been her silver lining. And then bam, we started talking about collaboration. But isn't it funny that it's not even just mm -hmm. 
collaboration with BD, I mean, I think you're at work collaborating closely with so many other um, groups, right? So with our communications team, with our BD team, with our creative design team, you're, I, I think personally, I'm working and I've gotten to know people way more than I did when I was in person. And we're relying on each other that much more as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Ariana, what about you? I feel like you're putting me on the spot here, Lindsay. For those that don't know, Lindsay and I used to work together. So. Yes, I know. Uh, how did actually, that go? Please explain how I used to work with and you. And I also <laughs> see a few of our BD team, my BD team members on the call too. So um, we were, we're a little bit different and stuff has changed um, in the time since Lindsay was at the firm and now, but a little bit different um, because we were already collaborating very closely together and that has increased. Um, but we already had that collaboration and it's key for success. And we also, it's so important that, that we go to the lawyers on the same page and have each other's backs and are delivering the same messaging across the board. So that's so important, especially right now, because um, there are some things, we do have to manage expectations a lot more right now and what is real and what is actually feasible. So making sure that we're all aligned is so important. Um, but I think that, at our firm, we've always, the BD and events has always been very closely aligned. And I think that's something that's very unique to law firms. Um, and having that sit together and be part of the same group is so key to success. Um, and we do, I mean, we have to develop the event formats like Carla was saying, and that's so key. And um, I think that we have a, a pretty good system in place with, with our team members. And the ROI is also really important. So um, we do a formal debrief document um, with where we highlight ROI, um, both from a stats perspective, but also analyzing again, um, which key clients came. And um, we look at, we also match that from year to year. So if it's an annual event, okay, so this client has typically had seven people attend every year. They didn't attend once is the content not relevant for them? Obviously we don't do that for every client, but for our key clients. So we look at those trends and analyze those mm -hmm. and make sure that we're prompting our lawyers to follow up after. So we can send our nice little email with their CPD hours, but um, what are those key things that they, can, that they can follow up on? And that's a big part of the collaboration between events and BD and lawyers. And what's been great is that we do ask for questions um, similar to when you registered for this event. So that's a natural touch point for the lawyers to reach out. Well, we noticed that you were interested in subject ABC um, and that's a perfect follow-up pre or post event for those touch points. We're also implementing um, formal lead generation in our, um, in, through our CRM system. So we will be scoring um, with a scoring events. So that's a project that I'm working on with our digital team, our CRM team um, and we have points attached to um, different engagements with events now. So um, asking a question has a higher engagement level, um, attending, mm -hmm. RSVPing, how many things they're opening out of what they receive. Um, we use Microsoft Dynamics 365, Kelly. Um, so we actually just onboarded that, um, still, still onboarding. So the lead generation, we're hoping to have that um, launched in the new year. And mm -hmm. Intro Hive has been another really important um, tool to really engage who knows who and those relationships and leverage them for our lawyers and then for our events as well. So looking at leveraging those client relationships to bring clients onto panels um, and to make sure that people are getting invited to content that matters. When you have multiple offices and multiple practice groups, you have clients that will work with or lawyers that will work with the same client and not all, always connect the dots. So we're really, we're really the, we're really connecting those dots all the time. So yeah. I can sometimes I get a request from one group on a top for to do an event on one topic, and another group's already doing an event on that same topic, different lens. But is there an opportunity to collaborate and showcase our skills there? So I want to just follow up and somebody's asked one question, are there any strategies you implement to encourage post event lawyer follow up so I would maybe have an example for that but on your um, very interesting comments about how you're rating, how you're rating things. Um, are you rating the clients who are engaging or the event itself because if I 
think back to my BLG days, there were, of course, some events that were like, why are we doing this for a third year? Like, we know that there is nothing coming from this. Um, or is it like, you know, Jane says she's going to come and never shows up. Is it the event or is it the person? Well, sorry to pick on Jane, but let's talk. So about we're, it. so we are rating both. Okay. Um, that's very cool. Well, we will, we'll, we will be, um, right yes. now we do do a post event survey where we rate the event from um, attendee feedback, but we will be looking at it both ways. Um, so starting off with the event itself and how many interactions that event had. So while mm -hmm. Jane's interaction could qualify for two points, we'll, we'll be looking at it from the big picture. So yeah. did this event, how many points did this event get um, from a generation perspective? Uh, and that's actually been a silver lining. Um, we've Love been able it. to get rid of some events that yeah. took place for 20 years and are not relevant anymore. And we were able to get rid of those over COVID and it made my heart so happy. Yeah. <laughs> Anna, Anna, sorry, okay. I have a question though. What if, so surveys are still working for you because they're not working for us. <laughs> so beginning of COVID, we did not have any success with surveys. Um, and we started putting a QR code at the end of the presentation and um, a, 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 we did an updated visual in our um, thank you for attending emails and our response rate increased by over 400%. It's still lower than pre-COVID, but uh -huh. um, at the beginning we were probably getting about five responses <laughs> to it. And now That's we're amazing. getting at least like we're getting um, averages in the fifties and things like that now. Um, so yeah. just that visual at the end where they can just quickly scan it, rate, make it quick, nice and fast has been so effective. It's totally free. Um, yeah. takes no special skills. We whip them, our team whips them up and working with creative services to have an eye catching, um, graphic to provide their mm -hmm. feedback has been so successful. Cause we just started throwing the survey in the chat. You know, like yeah, we do the same survey monkey in the chat before kind of when the webinar's wrapping up and maybe two responses. So that's very interesting. To yeah, go, do the QR code because even with the chat, you have to copy and paste it, put it in your browser mm -hmm. sometimes, depending on what platform you're using. Some let you put in hyperlinks, but WebEx um, does not. <laughs> Yay, WebEx. So the Q mm -hmm. highly recommend the QR code. Yeah. Um, so on the dynamic, sorry, I'm going to go back now to the dynamics thing. I'm sorry. This is so interesting to me. I love it. Um, do the lawyers know this is happening and are, are like to the a certain extent, do you feel like they're going to buy into it? Because I think there's one version of BD builds relationships with lawyers. So after the second or third event and it's total crap, your BD people actually do have the power and the relationships to say like, we're going to stop this. Um, but if it's more of a formula and more of a data piece, I wonder what, what do you think the lawyers are going to, how they're going to react? Well, let's talk Q2 next year. <laughs> um, we've been finding that our lawyers have been responding a lot better to data over COVID. And I think yeah. it's part of the digital digitization of our of the workforce. So, if you had asked me this pre-COVID, I would say I low expectations. <laughs> but right now, we're finding when we're presenting those facts and we're presenting thing, we're presenting the data to them that they are responding well to that. So we've done that when with our overall communication. So we just did a full communications audit, and that was just presented actually yesterday the results of that to our national management committee, because mm -hmm. we also did go through that route that I'm sure everyone can relate to where we were competing against ourselves for spaces and people's inboxes. Yeah. So that was a difficult conversation at the beginning. Um, but we did a full audit we um, and presented that and now people understand they're seeing the data, they're seeing the results They're it, they're absorbing it a lot better. Yeah. And I think I'm really excited for this, and I think it's going to be how we approach it. Um, we, it can't be, it, people take things personally, especially if they were delivering the content. So yeah. it's not saying this event sucked. Um, it is, okay, so this is an opportunity to relook at what our clients need. Yeah. So we still want to have that lawyer be a subject matter expert, but this obviously wasn't the best approach or the most yeah. topical subject. 
So I think that's probably another opportunity for events and BD to really get on the same page and collaborate and have those conversations with the lawyers, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a more rich experience for the clients. So it's like a win-win. Absolutely. Um, Okay, let's get back to this question that um, our friend Andrea had. Are there any strategies you implement to encourage post-event lawyer follow-up? So how do you get the lawyers to do the thing that you've asked them to do? So I would say at Lensner Slat, I'm just going to answer. Um, we do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. So um, we've sent out the post-event email that has all the materials, blah, blah, blah. And then we draft like a personal tailored email. Um, and all they have to do, um, you know, is press, press the big button that says send. Um, we have found that lawyers, or excuse me, clients have actually been really responsive. We just sent something out this week, um, very tailored, specific to clients, and we received a ton of feedback. Um, so, so we do, I, I guess my advice is just like, do as much heavy, list, heavy lifting as you can and tailor it to the extent that you can to the individual um, client. Um, to either yeah, lawyers just need things done easy for them, right? Yeah. And I, the same thing, the OFT files are key. And I find that a lot of our BDs are doing that is writing it out for them. All you need to do is insert the name and send it out. They want mm -hmm. things easy to, to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. So those were the last questions. I have um, one question, which I think, um, I guess we could just get rid of the deck now. Um, I think maybe Carla, this was the one that we were thinking of was, um, through the pandemic, I think some lawyers have sort of been doing their own thing. Is there any, um, are there any guides or materials or any sort of proactive, like Ariana mentioned, keeping up to date with which restaurants are on and which restaurants are unfortunately gone under? Um, are there any materials or things that you've um, put together, particularly maybe for your groups across the country that you would, um, you would suggest people prioritize? I mean, if I could, if I could put together a list of all of the guides that we've created during this <laughs> And I hope someone's looked at them because there's been a lot of work put into it. But, um, but I'd say, so what we're trying to implement right now, right, is for our lawyers to go beyond the file. That's what we're trying to call, that's what we're calling it. And, and what, you know, we've all been speaking to is to try to get that lawyer to take that client to go out, whether that means for dinner, that means, you know, take their family out apple picking, like Ariana mentioned, right? So we've created an idea generator. Um, this document that we sent to our, to our uh, lawyers with ideas, nothing very too specific. Some of them have specific details, but just ideas. And we put them into categories. So if you want to socialize, um, you know, we've put um, ideas for that. If you want, you know, something to be fun, like a game, mind benders, we've created things for that. If you want something active, like sporting events, we've put ideas for that. Just to get, you know, their ideas flowing. That's why it's the idea generator. And on that document, we've also included some best practices. So what should our lawyers do? How should they approach their clients? What should they be saying? You know, testing sort of their, their temperature on how do they feel about doing something in person. Again, small. Um, and then, you know, reiterating to the clients, you know, that their health and safety is of most importance to us, all of that. So, so we've kind of put in a few best practices when approaching the clients. And we're hoping that with this, it will, it will get our lawyers to start picking up the phone and reaching out and, and having that personal outreach and, you know, beyond, beyond the file and also beyond the computer. <laughs> um, Ariana, anything to add? We've done something similar. So our we've done a similar document. Ours is for reconnecting with clients and we've done that regionally. And this has also been, our BD team has been um, really big in making sure that this actually gets looked at. So when they're having their group meetings, um, they're sharing that document and making sure that everyone is aware of that. So mm -hmm. they've been great champions of that. Um, so again, very similar approach to Carla. Um, also, talk to your vendors. Um, they have been lifelines for us, especially in the technology area. They're so happy to do demos, to walk you through what's new, what's going on. Um, so have those conversations and um, maintain those relationships and um, collaborate with them so that when you do go back to in-person, you do know what's going on um, with that. The tourism bureaus are also fantastic resources about what's happening in the cities, um, and what um, is allowed prevent like with the regulations if you're not if you're not comfortable with um, the reopening plans and things like that the tour the destination Toronto destination and the equivalents across the country 
are really, really great resources because they have broken that down because that's our livelihood is understanding that. Um, yeah, so if you don't exactly. have con if you don't have contacts with them, um, I have them with probably every every major place in Canada. So I'm more than happy to make any connections for anyone. That's great. Um, Andrea's asked a question in the chat. What do you think the future of in-person events will look like with food service? So obviously like hot topic. <laughs> breakfast buffets are a thing of the past, ladies. Um, so she says here, no charcuterie boards anymore or only past appetizers. I think it might take a while for food station, uh, for folks to be comfortable with food stations. Any thoughts on that? I think it'll also depend on the venue itself, right? What they, I think a lot of the venues themselves are not even doing that right now. Maybe that'll change over time, but um, but but they're not doing the approach of, of charcuterie boards or, um, or, or family style meals. So it, de it definitely does depend on the province. Um, we actually had an internal social yesterday and um, this was the first time that a venue has actually passed appetizers. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was totally, it was up to us. They offered to do it. Um, and we did a combination of plattered um, personal plates and past. Um, I don't think food stations are going to go away at all, but the service will be different. The self, self serve is not gonna come back for a while, but mm -hmm. you will still have buffets that are being served by a staff member that has gloves, masks and things like that. So that there's only one person touching the utensils, yeah. but that kind of pick out a cheese board, grab yeah. your own slice of pizza. When you're dealing with a group, especially that doesn't know each other, yeah. um, most comfort levels are not there. So you're seeing more box lunches coming up um, and things like that. But it's it's an ongoing trend and the hotels aren't, and the venues aren't completely sure yet yeah. what that's going to look like. Can I say that um, I'm not really going to miss a buffet and I'm okay um, getting an individual slice of pizza and not like touching a, you know? Um, okay, there's no more questions in the chat, but I'm going to ask one last question and we only have a minute. So um, internal holiday party 2021, one minute each, what are you doing and what are you willing to share? Uh, Carla, you go. I don't plan them, so. <laughs> ah, okay, great answer, great answer. No, but, oh, I, but, um, but I, I, I have heard, um, no, so definitely no, no holiday party this year. It'll probably be just a gift that we send out to, to everybody and something, you know, virtually that, you know, yeah. another trivia, but no, as of now, there is absolutely, maybe if they'll, maybe some departments will be doing little small gatherings internally, but, yeah. but no big holiday party. And from what I've heard, being part of Tolopa, that that is the general consensus for all of the firms, majority of the firms. Interesting. Okay. Lensner Slat is doing an in-person holiday party. Ariana, you go. Um, so BLG people, you don't know this. You're not hearing it. Um, we will not be doing office-wide um, Christmas parties, but that has not been formally announced to all of the offices yet. Um, some are taking it better than others. <laughs> um, and some offices are very disappointed. <laughs> Kathleen's laughing, she's well aware <laughs> of this. Um, so navigating those conversations has been very tough. It actually, it, it went to the level of the National Management Committee with what we're doing for holiday parties. It's a very hot topic. Um, we are, we do have internal guidelines for gathering sizes. Mm -hmm. And right now those are at, and it varies a little, it varies province to province, but the highest allowed is 40 people outdoors. Um, and wow. 20 people indoors. So we are currently, I was speaking to our chief risk officer yesterday, and we are reviewing whether we will increase those indoor gathering numbers slightly. Um, we're looking at, at probably on the top end to 50 indoors. So mm -hmm. that really does limit what we can do. Yeah. Um, so it will be different in each office and it will be higher volume, which I'm not super excited about. <laughs> so we need to figure out the best ways to empower groups to do this on their own. Yeah, do smaller things, yeah. Which might be easier to do if you have multiple offices. Um, yeah, we've decided to do something outside um, during the day. So TBD on how that goes. We will all check in with each other on Q2 <laughs> and see how all this stuff went. Yeah. Um, but, hearing, okay. but hearing no interest in, in a virtual holiday party again, people just do not want to do that yeah. Um, yeah. internally. We are getting some client requests for virtual holiday things. I will say that the, um, the most time, the virtual event that took the most time last year was the, was the holiday party. And I wish to never do it again. Um, so happy holidays to everybody. <laughs> 
Um, okay, it's 101. I just want to say thank you so much, Ariana, so much, um, Carla. You guys have been um, amazing, not a surprise. I deemed you heavyweights at the beginning and you lived up to that. Um, you're both wonderful and thank you so much for taking the time. And thank you to the 54 people who stayed yes, with us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, that's so, uh, fantastic. And you're going to get 1 million thank yous in the chat right now. Um, but we will close it there and, um, hope to see everybody in person, virtually, whatever. We hope to see you all soon. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's perfect, Ariana. Thank you for doing that.